Hello everybody, happy Monday, it's me, Miss Natalie, and this is Read Along. We are reading the series, The Trial of Apollo, book one, The Hidden Oracle by Rick Riordan, and I believe we're doing chapter 35 today? I can't remember. Something like that. We should be getting pretty close though to finishing up the book. I think we'll be finishing it up either this week or a week from now, Monday. I gotta see how long the chapters are, but when we finished up, our our heroes, well, our hero was Apollo, and then like Meg, she helped him figure out how to channel the wind chimes so that they can understand the prophecy, and then she left, because she's really upset, and she thinks she has to help Nero because he's her, her stepfather. It's It's all complicated and sad, and yeah. But Apollo did save the the demigods who are now like, hey, we got to go back to uh, Camp Half-Blood to save it from Colossus. But it's not the regular Colossus. It's a Colossus of Nero that he had built uh, in Rome, and it's huge. And, uh, yeah, they're riding a big, big, big ant queen called Mama. It's pretty hilarious. And of course, here are my kittens. Sweet, sweet cats. Mr. Business and Six. Oh, I don't have a whole lot of pictures of Six. She's there in that top left with her arm all stretched out. She likes to sleep like that. I think it's silly. Um, I usually will have a picture or I'll have her on my lap, but she doesn't like to be there for too long because Mr. Business gets up there next to her and then she gets mad and she leaves because she doesn't like him. Be and she doesn't like him because he's mean to her. Like. He's a very typical little brother. She can't do anything without him, like, right there in her face. And then finally, contact information. Yay! So I also realized that we are coming up on a couple of years of read-along. We've been doing this since June of 2020. So I was wondering if you guys would like to do, like, a YouTube Live situation. And if you would, uh, go ahead and send me an email or put it on our Instagram on the libraries or on mine. And let's, let's like work that out. Cause that could be fun where we could all see each other. Yay. Chapter 35. Buck naked statue, a neurotic colossus. Where are thy undies? Even my supernatural powers of description fail me. Imagine seeing yourself as a hundred foot tall bronze statue, a replica of your own magnificence, gleaming in the late afternoon light. Now, imagine that this ridiculously handsome statue is wading out of Long Island Sound onto the North Shore. In his hand is a ship's rudder, a blade the size of a stealth bomber, fixed to a fifty-foot-long pole. And Mr. Gorgeous is raising said rudder to smash the crud out of Camp Half-Blood. This was the sight that greeted us as we flew in from the woods. How is that thing alive? Kayla demanded. What did Nero do? Order it online? The Triumvirate has vast resources, I told her. They've had centuries to prepare. Once they'd reconstructed the statue, all they had to do was fill it with some animating magic, usually the harnessed life force of wind or water spirits. I'm not sure. That's really more of Hephaestus' specialty. So how do we kill it? I'm, I'm working on that. All across the valley, campers screamed and ran for their weapons. Nico and Will were floundering in the lake, apparently having been capsized in the middle of a canoe ride. Chiron galloped through the dunes, carrying the Col or harrying the Colossus with his arrows. Even by my standards, Chiron was a very fine archer. He targeted the statue's joints and seams, yet his shots did not seem to bother the automaton at all. Already dozens of missiles struck from the Colossus's armpits and neck like unruly hair. More quivers! Chiron shouted, quickly! Rachel Dare stumbled from the armory carrying half a dozen, and she ran to resupply him. The Colossus brought down his rudder to smash the dining pavilion, but his blade bounced off the camp's magical barrier, sparking as if it had hit solid metal. Mr. Gorgeous took another step inland, but the barrier resisted him, pushing him back with the force of a wind tunnel. On Half-Blood Hill, a silver aura surrounded the Athena Parthenos. I wasn't sure the demigods could see it, but every so often a beam of ultraviolet light shot from Athena's helmet like a search lamp, hitting the Colossus's chest and pushing back the invader. Next to her, in the tall pine tree, the golden fleece blazed with fiery energy. 
The dragon Peleus hissed and paced around the trunk, ready to defend his turf. These were powerful forces, but I did not need godly sight to tell me that they would soon fail. The camp's defensive barriers were designed to turn away the occasional stray monster, to confuse mortals and to prevent them from detecting the valley, and to provide a first line of defense against invading forces. A criminally beautiful, hundred-foot-tall celestial bronze giant was another thing entirely. Soon, the Colossus would break through and destroy everything in its path. Apollo! Kayla nudged me in the ribs. What do we do? I stirred, again with the unpleasant realization that I was expected to have answers. My first instinct was to order a seasoned demigod to take charge. Wasn't it the weekend yet? Where was Percy Jackson? Or those Roman praetors, Frank Zhang and Reyna Ramirez Ariano? Yes, they would have done nicely. My second instinct was to turn to Meg McCaffrey. How quickly I had grown used to her annoying yet strangely endearing presence. Alas, she was gone. Her absence felt like a colossus stomping upon my heart. This was an easy metaphor to summon, since the colossus was presently stomping on a great many things. Flanking us on either side, the soldier ants flew in formation, awaiting the queen's orders. The demigods watched me anxiously, random bits of bandage fluff swirling from their bodies as we sped through the air. I leaned forward and spoke to Mama in a soothing tone. I know I cannot ask you to risk your life for us. Mama hummed as if to say to us, You're darn right. Just give us one pass around the statue's head, I asked. Enough to distract it. Then set us down on the beach? She clicked her mandibles doubtedly, doubtfully. You're the best mama in the whole world, I added, and you look lovely today. That line always worked with Leto. It did the trick with Mama Ant, too. She twitched her antennae, perhaps sending a high-frequency signal to her soldiers, and all three ants banked hard to the right. Below us, more campers joined the battle. Sherman Yang had harnessed two pegasi to a chariot and was now circling the statue's legs, while Julia and Alice threw electric javelins at the Colossus's knees. The missiles stuck in his joints, discharging tendrils of blue lightning, but the statue barely seemed to notice. Meanwhile, at his feet, Connor Stoll and Harley used twin flamethrowers to give the Colossus a molten pedicure, while the Nike twins manned a catapult, lobbing boulders at the Colossus, Colossus's celestial bronze crotch. Malcolm Pace, a true child of Athena, was coordinating the attacks from a hastily organized command post on the green. He and Nyssa had spread war maps across the card table and were shouting targeting, co targeting coordinate, coordinates. My goodness, why is that hard to say? While Chiara, Damian, Paolo, and Billy rushed to set up ballistae around the communal hearth. Malcolm looked like the perfect battlefield commander, except for the fact that he'd forgotten his pants. His red briefs made quite a statement with his sword and leather cuirass. Mama dove toward the Colossus, leaving my stomach at a higher altitude. I had a moment to appreciate the statue's regal features, its metal brow rimmed with a spiky crown meant to represent the beams of the sun. The Colossus was supposed to be Nero as the sun god, but the emperor had wisely made the face resemble mine more closely than his. Only the line of its nose and its ghastly neck beard suggested Nero's trademark ugliness. Also, did I mention that the hundred-foot god statue was entirely nude? Well, of course it was. Gods are almost always depicted as nude, because we are flawless beings. Why would you cover up perfection? Still, it was a little disconcerting to see my buck-naked self stomping around, slamming a ship's rudder at Camp Half-Blood. As we approached the Colossus, I bellowed loudly, Imposter! I am the real Apollo! You're ugly! Oh, dear reader, it was hard to yell such words at my own handsome visage, but I did. Such was my courage. The Colossus did not like being insulted. As Mama and her soldiers veered away, the statue swung its rudder upward. Have you ever collided with a bomber? I had a sudden flashback to Dresden in 1945, when the planes were so thick in the air I literally could not find a safe lane to drive in. The axle on the sun chariot was out of alignment for weeks after that. I realized the ants were not fast enough flyers to escape the rudder's reach. I saw ca catastrophe approaching in slow mo motion. At la or as the last possible moment, I yelled, Dive! We plunged straight down. The rudder only clipped the ants' wings, but it was enough to send us spiraling toward the beach. 
I was grateful for soft sand. I ate quite a bit of it when we crash-landed. By sheer luck, none of us died, though. Kayla and Austin had to pull me to my feet. Are you okay? Austin asked. Fine, I said. We must hurry. The Colossus stared down at us, perhaps trying to discern whether we were dying in agony yet or needed some additional pain. I had wanted to get its attention, and I had succeeded. Huzzah. I glanced at Mama and her soldiers, who were shaking the sand off their er, carapaces. Thank you. Now save yourselves. Fly. They did not need to be told twice. I suppose ants have a natural fear of large humanoids looming over them, about to squash them with a heavy foot. Mama and her guards buzzed into the sky. Miranda looked after them. I never thought I'd say this about bugs, but I'm going to miss those guys. Hey, called Nico D'Angelo. He and Will scrambled over the dunes, still dripping from their swim in the canoe lake. What's the plan? Will seemed calm, but I do I knew him well enough by now to tell that the inside he was as charged as a bare electrical wire. Boom! The statue strode toward us. One more step, and it would be on top of us. Isn't there a control valve on its ankle? Ellis asked. If we can open it. No, I said. You're thinking of Talos. This is not Talos. Nico brushed his dark, wet hair from his forehead. Then what? I had a lovely view of the Colossus's nose. Its nostrils were sealed with bronze. I suppose because Nero hadn't wanted his detractors trying to shoot arrows into his imperial noggin. I yelped. Kayla grabbed my arm. Apollo, what's wrong? Arrows into the Colossus's head. Oh, gods. I had an idea that would never, ever work. However... It seemed better than the other option, which was to be crushed under a two-ton bronze foot. Will, Kayla, Austin, I said. Come with me. And Nico, said Nico. I have a doctor's note. Fine, I said. Ellis, Cecil, Miranda, do whatever you can to keep the Colossus's attention. The shadow of an enormous foot darkened the sand. Now, I yelled, scatter! Ooh, okay. Next chapter. Chapter 36. I love me some plague. When it's on the right arrow. Kabam! You dead, bro? Scattering was the easy part. They did that very well. Miranda, Cecil, and Ellis ran in different directions, screaming insults at the Colossus and waving their arms. This brought the rest of us a few seconds as we sprinted for the dunes, but I suspected the Colossus would soon enough come after me. I was, after all, the most important and attractive target. I pointed toward Sherman Yang's chariot, which was still circling the statue's legs in a vain attempt to electrocute its kneecaps. We need to commandeer that chariot. How? Kayla asked. I was about to admit I had no idea when Nico D'Angelo grabbed Will's hand and stepped into my shadow. Both boys evaporated. I had forgotten about the power of shadow traveling, the way children of the underworld could step into one shadow and appear from another, sometimes hundreds of miles away. Hades used to love sneaking up on me that way and yelling, Hi! Just as I shot an arrow of death. He found it amusing if I missed my target and accidentally wiped out the wrong city. Austin shuddered. I hate it when Nico disappears like that. What's our plan? You two are my backup, I said. If I miss, if I die, it will be up to you. Whoa, whoa, Kayla said. What do you mean if you miss? I drew my last arrow, the one I'd found in the grove. I'm going to shoot that gorgeous gargantuan in the ear. Austin and Kayla exchanged looks, perhaps wondering if I'd finally cracked under the strain of being mortal. A plague arrow, I explained. I'm going to enchant an arrow with sickness, then shoot it into the statue's ear. Its head is hollow. The ears are the only openings. The arrow should release enough disease to kill the Colossus's animating power, or at least to disable it. How do you know it will work? Kayla asked. I don't, but our conversation was ruined by a sudden heavy downpour of Colossus foot. We darted inland, barely avoiding being flattened. Behind us, Miranda shouted, Hey, ugly! I knew she wasn't talking to me, but I glanced back anyway. She raised her arms, causing ropes of seagrass to spring from the dunes and wrap around the statue's ankles. The Colossus broke through them easily, but they annoyed him enough to be a distraction. Watching Miranda face the statue made me heartsick for Meg all over again. Meanwhile, Ellis and Cecil stood on either side of the Colossus, throwing rocks at his shins. From the camp, a volley of flaming ballista projectiles exploded against Mr. Gorgeous's naked backside, 
which made me clench in sympathy. You were saying? Austin asked. Right. I twirled the arrow between my fingers. I know what you're thinking. I don't have godly powers. It's doubtful I'll be, able, I'll be able to cook up the Black Death or the Spanish flu. But still, if I can make the shot from close range straight into its head, I might be able to do some damage. And if you fail? Kayla asked. I noticed her quiver was also empty. I won't have the strength to try twice. You'll have to make another pass. Find an arrow, try to summon some sickness, make the shot while Austin holds the chariot steady. I realized this was an impossible request, but they accepted it with grim silence. I wasn't sure whether to feel grateful or guilty. Back when I was a god, I would have taken it for granted that mortals had faith in me. Now, I was asking my children to risk their lives again, and I was not at all sure my plan would work. I caught a flash of movement in the sky. This time, instead of a colossus foot, it was Sherman Yang's chariot, minus Sherman Yang. Will brought the Pegasi in for a landing, then dragged out a half-conscious Nico D'Angelo. Where are the others? Kayla asked. Sherman and the Hermes girls. Will rolled his eyes. Nico convinced them to disembark. As if in cue, I heard Sherman screaming from somewhere far in the distance, I'll get you, D'Angelo! You guys go, Will told me. The chariot is only designed for three, and after that shadow travel, Nico is going to pass out any second. No, I'm not. Nico complained, then passed out. Will caught him in a fireman's carry and took him away. Good luck! I'm going to get the Lord of Darkness here some Gatorade. Austin hopped in first and took the reins. As soon as Kayla and I were aboard, we shot skyward, the Pegasi swerving and banking around the Colossus with expert skill. I began to feel a glimmer of hope. We might be able to outmaneuver the giant hunk of good-looking bronze. Now, I said, if I can just enchant this arrow with a nice plague... The arrow shuddered from its fletching to its point. Thou shalt not, it told me. I try to avoid weapons that talk. I find them rude and distracting. Once, Artemis had a bow that could cuss like a Phoenician sailor. Another time, a sto in a Stockholm ca tavern, I met this god who was smoking hot, except his talking sword would not shut up. But I digress. I ask the obvious question. Did you just speak to me? The arrow quivered. Oh dear, that was a horrible pun. My apologies. Yeah, verily, prithee, shooting is not my purpose. His voice was definitely male, sonorous and grave, like a bad Shakespearean actor's. But you're an arrow, I said. Shooting you is the whole point. Ah, uh, I must really watch those puns. Guys, hang on, Austin shouted. The chariot plunged to avoid the Colossus's swinging rudder. Without Austin's warning, I would have been left in midair, still arguing with my projectile. So you're made from Dordona oak, I guessed. Is that why you talk? Forsooth, said the arrow. Apollo, Kayla said. I'm not sure why you're talking to that arrow, but... From our right came a reverberating wang, like a snapped power line hitting a metal roof. In a flash of silver light, the camp's magical barriers collapsed. The Colossus lurched forward and brought his foot down on the dining pavilion, smashing it to rubble like so many children's blocks. But that just happened, Kayla said with a sigh. The Colossus raised his rudder in triumph. He marched inland, ignoring the campers who were running around his feet. Valentina Diaz launched a ballista mi uh, missile into his groin. Again, I had to win some sympathy. Harley and Connor Stoll kept blowtorching his feet, to no effect. Nyssa, Malcolm, and Chiron hastily ran a trip line of steel cable across the statue's path, but they would never have time to anchor it properly. I turned to Kayla. You can't hear this arrow talking? Judging from her wide eyes, I'm guessing the answer was no. And does hallucinating run in the family? Never mind. I looked at the arrow. What would you suggest, O oh, wise missile of Dodona? My quiver is empty. The arrow's point dipped toward the statue's left arm. Lo, the armpit doth hold the arrows thou needest. Kayla yelled, Colossus is heading for the cabins. Armpit, I told Austin. Flyeth, er, fly for the armpit. That wasn't an order one heard much in combat, but Austin spurred the Pegasi into a steep ascent. We buzzed the forest of arrows sticking out of Colossus's arm seam. 
but I completely overestimated my mortal hand-eye coordination. I lunged for the shafts and came up empty. Kayla was more agile. She snagged a fistful, but screamed when she yanked them free. I pulled her to safety. Her hand was bleeding badly, cut from high-speed grab. I'm fine, Kayla yelped. Her fingers were clenched, splattering drops of red all over the chariot's floor. Take the arrows. I did. I tugged the Brazilian flag bandana from around my neck and gave it to her. Bind your hand, I told her. There's some ambrosia in the coat pocket. Don't worry about me. Kayla's face was as green as her hair. Make the shot. Hurry. I inspected the arrows. My heart sank. Only one of the missiles was unbroken, and its shaft was warped. It would be almost impossible to shoot. I looked again at the talking arrow. Thou shalt not thinkest about it, he intoned. Enchant thou warp, enchant thou the warped arrow. Oh, it's so weird. I tried. I opened my mouth, but the proper words of enchantment were gone from my mind. As I feared, Lester Papadopoulos simply did not possess the power. I can't. I shall assist, promised the arrow of Dodona. Startest thou, plaguey, plaguey, plaguey. The enchantment does not start plaguey, plaguey, plaguey. Who are you talking to? Austin demanded. My arrow! I, I need more time. We don't have more time. Kayla pointed with her wrapped bloody hand. The Colossus was only a few steps away from the central green. I wasn't sure the demigods even realized how much danger they were in. The Colossus could do much more than flatten buildings. If he destroyed the central hearth, the sacred shrine of Hestia, he would extinguish the very soul of the camp. The valley would be cursed and uninhabitable for generations. Camp Half-Blood would cease to exist. I realized I had failed. My plan would take much too long. If I could even remember how to make a plague arrow, this was my punishment for breaking an oath to the River Styx. Then, from somewhere above us, a voice yelled, Hey, bronze butt! Over the Colossus's head, a cloud of darkness formed like a cartoon dialogue bubble. Out of the shadows dropped a furry black monster dog, a hellhound, and astride his back was a young man with a glowing bronze sword. The weekend was here. Percy Jackson had arrived. Oh my gosh, I love Percy. Okay, we will do the next, I think the last three chapters on Wednesday. We'll have to see how long they are. Everybody have a good day.